Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Happy Friday and welcome to today's conversation, Climate Policy in Action, the next four years. This will be a conversation with Frank Cesno and John E. Morton. We will begin our program shortly. Please want you to note that the Q&A function is turned on. So please submit any questions you might have through that functionality there at the bottom of your Zoom window and we will address them as we can throughout the course of the conversation. We will begin momentarily, thank you. Welcome everybody uh, to our very interesting conversation today, uh, looking at the road ahead uh, for the Biden administration on the uh, agenda surrounding climate change. I'm Frank Cesno. Um, I hang out at the George Washington University and Planet Forward and um, all sorts of good things relating uh, to um, sustainability and, and climate change, but it is my great pleasure this year to be a Global Futures Fellow with Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. Um, and through this connection, and we are partnering and collaborating on many things, we are very firmly focused on what is right now, in many ways, the most pressing challenge facing humanity at the most remarkable moment where we have science and technology and business and innovation coinciding with a massive political change, change of administrations in Washington from an administration that um, was not putting climate change anywhere near the top of the agenda or maybe on an agenda at all to one that is putting it very, very high up there. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with John Morton who worked in the Obama administration, the National Security Council, leading the way on energy and climate change. But first I'd, I'd, I'd like to hand this over to Peter Schlosser. Uh, he's the Vice President, Vice Provost of the Julian Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. Um, and he is a, a, a great proponent of the idea that we need to look forward um, across disciplines uh, to really make a, a very substantial change. And that's what he's trying to do. So Peter, uh, over to you. Thank you, Frank. And uh, what a great event we have ahead of us. I'm looking forward to, together with all of you to this uh, stimulating this discussion that Frank and Sean will have in uh, after just a short introduction that I will give. If we are looking in to put context around that, if we are looking at the world that presents that we are presented with that we actually have shaped, we are actually seeing that the consequences of many of the pressures we have put upon the planet. We have we are in essence, we are asking the planet to, to provide us with more than the planet has to give. So that expresses itself in many of the well-known features and, and that are being talked about, that you all know about, such as biodiversity loss, loss of ecosystem services, uh, the uh, related worry about food security, water security, and climate. And climate often, and this will be the, the topic of today's conversation, of course, climate is a topic that has been discussed since a long time and has been discussed very controversially at times, very polarized. And when I'm looking at, uh, at the climate dis uh, discussion, I uh, often see that, you know, that there are many facets to it. We know about it since a long time. We also know by now, actually since quite a while, what we can do to deal with that discussion or with that problem actually. And if we are uh, considering what influences that, it is decisions that are made on many fronts. It's decisions that are made by individuals, it's decisions that are made by the private sector, by many other stakeholders, and importantly, in the dom uh, political domain. And I often uh, you know, like to compare the changes on the political side with those that we are often using describing climate, which is in climate 
you can have abrupt changes. You can go from one state to another. I think we see the same in the political landscape. For example, changes in administration really can lead to very different takes and different actions with respect to environmental issues, in our case, climate. One of these changes is just ahead of us. On January 20, 2021, a new administration in the US will take over and will set the country's priorities with respect to climate change. Now that offers a lot of opportunities and some of them, of course, include the um, change in the energy system. We, we have now the opportunity to change the energy system from mainly fossil based to increasingly uh, and to, to an, a system that increasingly uses renewable energy. That this is not just a benefit for the climate system, but also offers opportunities for society as a whole, for the private sector. There are opportunities to help the atmosphere to find an equilibrium with respect to the greenhouse gases. For example, support for negative emissions that we need to meet the goals that are laid out in the Paris Accord that was signed about five years ago, but also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 1.5 degree report that lays out a very clear timeline that we have to meet, which is if we want to keep the planet at a temperature of less than two degrees above what was uh, considered as the natural temperature, the climatology, we have to halve our emissions of uh, greenhouse gases of CO2 in that, in that sense, in that case, by 2030, very short time scale, we have to act very quickly to do that. And by the middle of the century, we have to be in essence carbon neutral in a, in a, uh, in the sense uh, net zero carbon. And that means that by then we have to have upscaled our capacity to take carbon back out of the atmosphere, typically uh, known as um, negative emissions. So these are topics that Frank and John will discuss, the opportunities to further them in this new administration. There are also, of course, natural topics that are at the center of what the Julian Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory does. And here we are not just dealing with the technical issues, with understanding from a natural science and engineering perspective, what the situation is, what we can do about it, but we also are looking at what kind of choices does society have and within society, the political domain to move us forward more rapidly along such a trajectory. And the final point, we are in a very special time right now. We have just about nine months ago, maybe a year ago by now, we have uh, experienced not just in addition to our uh, long-term changes, the event of uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, that came as a shock. And that actually shows us how fragile the Earth system is, how little it takes to bring it out of balance, how prepared we have to be to take action when we have the opportunity to act. But it also, if there is one uh, silver lining in that, besides the vaccine, it is that there are now significant resources made available for the recovery. And of course, we all hope that some of these resources in the new administration will be used to help accelerate the action to mitigate phenomena such as climate change in a much more uh, rapid pace. So with that, I will conclude my introductory remark and turn over to Frank. Let me just uh, say a few words about uh, Frank uh, Cessno. Frank is the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. As already mentioned, he's also, and we are lucky that he is uh, serving that role, he's a Global Futures uh, Fellow at 
uh, Arizona State University within the Global Futures Laboratory. He founded uh, the Planet Forward platform and he hosts and facilitates uh, on that platform the Salon series that focus on topics such as energy policy, green jobs, and food production. The way I got to know uh, Frank quite a while ago was when I moved from, from Germany to the US, I was getting oriented in a new, in a new media world. And uh, one person that caught my attention on uh, CNN was Frank, because he reported from around the world, from Washington, and I found his contributions always extremely factual, true thinking, and informative. And uh, so I was, was uh, always looking for contributions that, that Frank made uh, in, in that way. Uh, I want to mention that uh, Frank got many recognitions for his contributions. And I just want to highlight one. He uh, uh, was awarded an, an Emmy for his 1993 report on the Midwest uh, of, uh, flooding. So even then, he already was uh, deeply concerned about the environment and where we are driving uh, ourselves in uh, by putting too much pressure on it. So with that, I will hand over to, to Frank and I'm looking forward to an inspiring uh, conversation between him and John Morton. Peter, thank you very much. Really appreciate that and uh, your very thoughtful <clears throat> remarks. <clears throat> Harking back to 1993, which seems like yesterday, but wasn't. Uh, you know, I wanna thank you for your leadership at the Global Futures Laboratory at ASU generally. ASU is really leading the way with a commitment to sustainability and to bringing different disciplines together to solve problems. And that's what it should all be about. Uh, I wanna introduce John Morton. John Morton uh, joins us with an incredible uh, background. John, partner at Pollination now, specialist in climate change and advisory and investment firm. So John, welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. And thank you, Peter. And thanks for the invitation to be part of this conversation today. Well, John, um, you not only are at Pollination and a partner there, and I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, you were in the Obama administration, the National Security Council, you were sort of the energy and climate change driver there. Um, and we're going to tap into your vast knowledge of what happened in that administration, what's happened since and what may happen going forward. Uh, but what is Pollination quickly? What is this firm that you're leading now? Sure. So we're at Pollination is a, a, a one-year-old uh, uh, startup, essentially. We're about 60 people big right now. And we are a firm dedicated to uh, advising and investing around climate change. Um, we see the imperative to move on climate change as both an environmental imperative, a moral, a social, a human rights, a human, a human health uh, uh, issue, but also a tremendous uh, economic opportunity for companies governments, corporations, financial institutions, et cetera, who can reorient their thinking around the fact that we are moving to a low carbon economy. And so we advise uh, basically on transition pathways for companies and, uh, and, and uh, financial institutions, governments, et cetera, who are looking to expedite the movement to a lower carbon economy. In the Obama administration, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you were the senior director for energy and climate at the National Security Council. So you looked at international energy climate change issues. Um, you were also, before that, um, uh, you were vice president for investment policy over at uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. So there you were overseeing big portfolios of investment, like $20 billion or something like that around the world. So you kind of know what you're talking about here. Um, and I, I just want to thank you again for, for, for joining us. We're having this conversation at a pretty timely moment. In fact, I just got a an alert on my phone uh, from NPR, just to be clear about where it's coming from. Here's what it says. 2020 is in a dead heat tie for the hottest year on record. Here are four ways extreme temperatures are uh, took a toll on the planet. John, the, 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 the Biden administration is coming at a very different point in both the planet's trajectory and what's happening and in the business environment and the political environment. What are you looking forward to in terms of how significant they're really going to be able to make climate change as a as an issue 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think, look, all the indications are, are pointing in the right direction from the standpoint of the incoming administration. I mean, first of all, the team that they've put together is, um, is, is unprecedented in many ways, uh, both the seniority of it, the structure of it, the diversity of it, and diversity from a, not just a, uh, not just a, a racial standpoint, but uh, diversity of backgrounds, experiences, um, uh, and, and, and focuses within the climate uh, conversation. Um, this is as much an environmental justice uh, set of considerations for the Biden administration as it is an environmental imperative and the two things are, are closely intermarried. So I think there is a, there is a, um, there's a, there's a tremendous energy around the, the team, the structure, the priority that's been given to climate change. The Biden administration has, has made climate change one of its top four stated priorities. That's never happened before for any incoming administration. Um, and I think what really gives me uh, hope and, um, and, uh, and, and assurance that this is not going to be a, uh, uh, you know, an afterthought uh, or a or a struggle to to kind of implement th these ideas is that um, Biden is entering and uh, with economic what I would call economic tailwinds behind him in two very specific ways. One, there's a huge stimulus and probably several rounds of stimulus and recovery funding that will be coming through. So because, the, of, because of COVID in response to COVID. COVID. Exactly. So in the spirit of never letting a crisis, you know, never, never, never lose an opportunity from a crisis, this is a moment to orient that those investments, and those spendings in very uh, progressive forward leaning ways, uh, number one. And number two, we're at a point with respect to the underlying costs of many of the enabling technologies behind the transition to a low carbon economy. Many of those costs have come down so quickly. Uh, and so consistently over the last, let's say, five to 10 years, that what would have been an uphill push and was an uphill push during the last stimulus bill in 2008, 2009, coming out of the Great Recession, to try to orient some of those funds toward renewables, et cetera. I think now um, we have economic tailwinds. Those are cheaper technologies, easier to deploy, far more acceptance of them in, in the country. Right, when you came in uh, and when Obama came in in 2008, most of these renewables were vastly more expensive than the fossil fuels <clears throat> that they were competing with. That's not always the case now. We'll come back to that. But let me ask you about the team, the new team here in the Biden administration. John Kerry, special envoy for climate. Gina McCarthy, former EPA administrator, national climate advisor, focused domestically. Michael Regan, um, who will head the Environmental Protection Agency, first African-American man to do that. Uh, Brenda Mallory to serve as the White House Counsel on Environmental Quality. She's an environmental law expert, and she will be the first black chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. Deb Holland, Representative Deb Holland, she'd be the at the Department of the Interior, first Native American to be in the, in a cabinet position. Um, Jennifer Granholm, Energy Secretary. Jennifer Granholm has been part of Planet Forward in the past. I know her very very well. She is a fierce advocate for electric vehicles and for um, renewable energy and, and climate change, heading the energy department. Janet Yellen, treasury secretary, climate's a huge issue for her. Pete Buttigieg, transportation secretary, same thing for him. How do you see in the practical sense, this team putting climate change across government, what will be the biggest shift from what we're experiencing and have experienced under the Trump administration, which has been a big advocate to deregulate and support fossil fuels. Frank, I think the biggest shift is what you just what you just laid out. The fact that um, these people who have been appointed uh, or nominated to these roles are seasoned senior uh, uh, um, uh, executives uh, and, and, and government officials who have, uh, have, have, have a track record of getting things done. Uh, and the fact that you did just what I was going to do, which was which was not stop at EPA, not stop at CEQ, uh, not stop at uh, um, uh, the traditional environmental organizations, but you very specifically talked about transportation, you talked about energy, you talked about treasury. Um, let's add agriculture to that uh, to that mix as well. Um, climate change is a is a whole of government. It's a whole of world, but it's a whole of government problem. And the fact that we are appointing, nominating people who have very specifically said that climate change will be part of their agenda in agencies where climate change has always been kind of a peripheral issue, never really, you know, the spotlight, um, I think is a huge indication, again, of the seriousness with which this incoming. Well, what about the, what about the criticism, though, and there has been some that a lot of these folks are back for a second gig. 
Uh, they're old timers. They're, they don't represent the, the AOC, new generation, Green New Deal. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, show me a transition in history where the uh, early nominees have been universally and you know endorsed by by everyone and you know and I'll I'll, I'll be surprised um I think I think what you have here is a very um compelling mixture of seasoned folks who are coming back to into service and and some new appointees who are certainly going to breathe some new blood into the uh uh in, into the conversation I guess I would argue here that with something that is as urgent and as pressing uh, uh, as, as, as climate change, it certainly does not hurt to have people who have worked together before and who understand how to get things done within government. I've I'm personally been in, you know, in the situation room in many, in many very high level meetings with John Kerry and Gina McCarthy and others, and they work well together uh, and they know each other. And that is a benefit. Uh, so sure. let, me, let me ask you one more about that. And then I want to crawl into the particulars and the signs and some of the other things of, of what lies ahead. There are some pretty big names here. Some of them have some pretty big egos. <laughs> Who's gonna call the shots on this? Is it John Kerry? Now he's the, he's the czar, right? Is it, is, it, is it, you know, Jennifer Granholm? She's the energy secretary. Uh, you've got um, all these play players. How do you make this, who's, who, how does this, this actually work? Well, it's, Frank, it's a it's a good question, and and I think it's it's the right one to be asking, and and I and I'm sure that um, the the team putting you know is 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 focused on this. Let me say structurally on the domestic side, we've seen Gina McCarthy and her deputy Ali Zaidi, who is a terrific guy as well, uh, with with deep experience in uh, both the Obama administration and most recently in New York State um, as as their lead uh, climate climate czar there. Um, the structure there is that Gina McCarthy will be helping to coordinate uh, and manage the domestic agencies and their implementation of uh, climate policy. Um, on the international side, it's a little bit less clear on how that will tie into the White House. And I think that's something that the team is thinking hard about now is how do you ensure that John Kerry, who will be sitting at state but has a position on the National Security Council for matters of climate, how do you ensure that that operation is well integrated into the functioning of the of the West Wing. That has historically occurred through the National Security Council, where I sat, um, with a deputy national security advisor who oversees the climate focus. And I think the question will be, who is that person? How does that team look? What the integration looks like? And that's a position that has not yet been appointed. All right, John, let's climb into how this actually gets done now for a little bit. A Biden campaign on a platform, and I'm pulling the words from his from his campaign to put the United States on an irreversible path to achieve net zero emissions economy-wide no later than 2050. Mm -hmm. What are their priorities? Where do you expect them to start? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, let's think about what you just said, net zero by 2050. I think for most people who are probably paying attention to this conversation for the first time or, or, or who aren't well versed in it, that seems almost like an absurdity. Right? How do you take all the carbon out of, out of an economy in, in a 30 year period? Um, the fact is, it's not an absurdity. There are very clear kind of pathways and trajectories that have been worked on for literally the last decade that show various ways of achieving that goal. You know, Princeton just put out a really interesting and detailed um, a study two days ago now that I recommend folks look at um, with, with their own uh, pathways to, to net zero. But the fact is we did the same exercise in the Obama administration. Um, and the fact is there's dozens, hundreds literally of dials that one can adjust in order to get to that, uh, to get to that. Um, so where will they start? Where do you expect well, them to start dialing? So, so I think the, you know, there's, there's some easy ones to start. And those are dials that we had dialed up pretty hard during the, during the last years of the Obama administration. And I expect we will kind of revert to those very quickly. So cafe standards and fuel economy standards for cars, pretty clear. Um, that not only is that something that we should be doing from an environmental standpoint, but lo and behold, most auto manufacturers want that to happen as well, because here's a fact, 40% of the world's population now lives in countries that have stated that they will be banning the, um, the, 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 the production and sale of the internal combustion engine. If you're an auto manufacturer today, why on earth would you not be gearing your R&D and your production toward a lower carbon Electri electrified uh, vehicle fleet. I think US manufacturers realize that now and realize that the Trump administration probably gave them too much leeway 
uh, which puts them at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis their uh, foreign, foreign um, uh, competitors. I think the second area is clearly around kind of methane emissions. Uh, uh, methane is a dangerous, as you well know, an extremely potent, dangerous greenhouse gas. Um, and uh, again, it's an area where the large oil and gas companies actually welcome uh, further regulation because if you're releasing less methane, you are capturing more of the product that you're trying to sell. And you so expect, the, expect this administration to work with existing fossil fuel companies, for example, in a collaborative way on that, or just to slam them with regulation? I think that there will be a collaborative approach. And I think this is an example of where the industry sees it coming. And industries have to decide right now, right? Are they, going, are they going to stand and oppose and fight, or are they going to get on board with a transition which is occurring not just in the US, but globally? Um, you know, the French, French oil company, Angie, uh, uh, in September, uh, um, was uh, the French government did not allow Angie to make a $20 billion investment into the United States because it was seen that the company receiving that investment in Louisiana was not uh, what was uh, was was emitting more methane from its Texas oil fields than was appropriate and consistent with Angie's own commitment to transition. So we're seeing decisions made overseas that reflect and and and, and uh, are, are are taking it take, beginning to take a toll on high emitting uh, sectors in the U.S. Well, John, let me ask you about another dial that I, I know that the Biden administration is going to try to turn because they've already talked about that. It's a dial that the uh, Trump administration turned the other direction, which is around regulation uh, and what the government is doing. And that's really everything from the Paris Climate Accord to the Clean Power Plan, but deregulation in particular that the uh, Trump administration went after. Methane standards, as you mentioned, pipelines, the coal ash rule, fuel economy standards, there were oil leases. Anwar is a good example in Alaska. Which of these deregulated areas do you expect the Biden administration will target first? And how long will it take them, if they do that, to change? Um, there's a series of, as we've seen, there's a series of executive, you know, you can do a lot with the executive, with executive pen and the executive orders. And I think, I, I, you know, I've highlighted a couple of the ones that I expect would, would occur first around oil and gas and around uh, ending leases on federal lands for, for extractive uh, industries. Uh, and, and mine uh, and oil and gas uh, exploration. Um, I would expect you know fairly significant cafe standards and, and uh, vehicle uh, uh, regulations to go to go back into force. But again, I don't think that these are going to be unexpected, and nor do I think they will receive nearly the level of opposition that they might have received, you know, ten years ago when the you last don't? round of these were 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 issued in. Really. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's going to be opposition, but the question is, you have to. I mean, industry has to step forward and say we 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 oppose, you know, stronger regulation. The question is, what do they then do about it? How much do they mobilize? How much do they activate around around these things? Well, let's, let, so let's pivot into industry and where the financial finance markets are. You know, when President Obama came in in 2008 and tried to make this an issue, as we pointed out earlier, renewable energy was a very expensive alternative to cheap fossil fuels. Um, so now renewable can even be cheaper. How do you see the Biden administration sort of expediting, advancing, accelerating a transformation that's already underway? What does it do to push that? So I think what you just said is really important, uh, and it and it. So let me focus on the on 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 the on the underlying facts. Last year, the last two years in the U.S., about seventy five percent of the new energy installation capacity that was built in this country was renewable energy. 75%. About 75%, right? This is, this is under a Trump administration, which is overtly, you know, uh, supportive of coal, uh, supportive of, 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 of fossil, you know, uh, development and, and, and discouraging of renewable energy, 75%. Um, globally, it was about the same number. Uh, the, I, uh, the, the International Energy Association predicts that in the next three years, up to 90% of the new energy installation capacity that's being built will be renewable energy, right? So we are at a point, I like to say, where, where alternative energy today is actually the fossil industry, if you're talking about new development, right? Conventional energy is renewable energy today, globally. And that's occurring not because of environmental regulations mainly, but because it's cheaper and the costs have come down so precipitously. So, uh, and, and, and that's, a, that's a global phenomenon. That's not simply a US phenomenon. 
Um, so I think one of the challenges is, is, is not necessarily how do you expedite the deployment of renewables, because that's actually happening at a relatively healthy clip right now. I think a bigger question and one which has international implications is how do you think about financing the closure of high emitting uh, coal assets around the world? Because on one side, we need to be doing more green, but on the other side, we actually need to be, you know, shutting down, beginning to expedite the, the transition away from existing emit, uh, high emitting assets. And that's a really hard question. Which, so what are we going to do? What does Biden do about that? Well, so it's a good, it's a good question and one that the team, I think, is, is, is looking, looking pretty, pretty carefully at. Um, the fact is, if you look today, if you're, a pub, if you're a public financier, as I was at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, right, trying to deploy U.S. Uh, taxpayer money on behalf of both development objectives uh, and climate objectives. The fact is you get a higher bang for the buck often from a climate perspective by financing the closure of an asset than you do by financing the construction of a new asset. And the way that works is that, for example, let's just take for the example of South Africa really quickly right here, right? South Africa has a heavily indebted public utility called ESCOM. 92% of its, of its power comes from, comes from, uh, comes from coal. Um, uh, but it has an incredibly high uh, 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 carrying cost for its debt, you know, very, very high debt levels. And so the question here is, is South Africa willing to accept lower cost refinancing uh, to assume some of that debt in return for a public commitment to begin a expedited transition away from coal? And that's an ongoing conversation that we're having. It's a great conversation. And I, I don't want to go down the, the rabbit hole with you on this, but I do want to ask you uh, how you think, I'm trying to get you to be very specific here, Biden administration deals with something like that closure of coal. When you're talking about jobs in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Montana, in, in all across this country, yeah. fracking and the, the fossil, you may, you may say that this is, this is now the alternative energy, but it's still the baseline energy. And we're going to get into a little bit of politics a little bit later in this conversation, but politics still matter. I mean, you know, we're, we're, this is not exactly a, a, a groundswell here. The country is very supportive of this. So does Biden get in the position, does the Biden administration get in the position of shutting down these industries? And how does it manage the people and the politics if it does? Yeah, so it's very clear. I mean, let me just let me just be, be be clear and careful about what I'm saying here. I think there is a financial there are, there are financial ways of doing this, which uh, which provide the incentives and the compensation for these types of activities. So the so market for, sh the markets shut these things down. Well, I mean that's happening already, right? We've seen more coal closures right. under Trump than we saw in, under Obama, right? And that's and that that is a pure market market driven mechanism. So the question is, how do you move that faster? And you know, take for example the European Union. They have a very very clear uh, and, and large what they call just transition fund, which is available to member states within the EU who are prepared to take steps like this. Right? So it's essentially a public support for that transition because there's an understanding that the climate benefits of that transition require and merit some additional public support. Um, and, and that's, that's you know, I was on a call this morning regarding how to deploy that most effectively in Poland, which is in the midst of a similar conversation about how do they transition more quickly away from coal. Biden has talked about a $2 trillion accelerated investment, right, in infrastructure, in the auto industry, and all across. Is that money really there, John? And how quickly will that be deployed? How much of a difference does that make? Um, I, look, the question of whether the money is there will be a question of, of, of a number of things, including what happens in Georgia in early, in early Janu January. But, um, but whether it's $2 trillion or $1.5 trillion uh, or the $900 billion that's being you know, discussed right now, um, there will be significant amounts of money and there will be a question of how that money is deployed. Um, and there's big leverage uh, by, by, being, by having the White House and the Treasury uh, in terms of setting the priorities for how those funds will be, will, will be spent. I am optimistic, perhaps more than I should be, uh, that there will be less resistance to a greening of that package than there, than there might, uh, than, than, the, than the politics of climate change in the U.S. might suggest there should be. Um, why is that? Because I think increasingly people do see that the transition 
again, to a low carbon economy is occurring and that this is a comparative and competitive advantage for the U.S. to be right. leading that as opposed to be falling behind. Right. That is a very, very important point to make over and over and over again. This is not just about tree hugging trees and putting in solar panels. This is about keeping America out front and inventing the next layer of jobs and employment and invention and science and everything else that this country needs to be to, to be competitive. Uh, a couple more things I want to go over with, with a few, for a few minutes, and then I want to invite the audience questions. We're getting a few, and if you're in the audience now and you've got a question for John about the future of the Biden administration and its uh, uh, climate change agenda, please put that in. Uh, into your chat and we'll get to as many as we can in just a few minutes. Um, I said I wanted to circle back on the question of um, environmental justice and equity, which is something that has been a theme in the Biden, in the Biden announcements of the team. What is that likely to entail from a policy perspective, John? You've been there, you've been in the situation, you've been elsewhere. If we were to bring in to the highest levels of this government, a serious commitment to environmental justice, what does that change? What does it change? Well, that's interesting. I thought you were gonna say, what does it look like? So what does it, what does it change? I think it changes the politics of, um, the, uh, of, the, of the stakeholders and, and people who, are, um, uh, who, who see climate and climate response and climate action as something that is serving them and in their best interest. I think for, for too long, the environmental movement writ large has been, uh, has not taken into consideration, frankly, the day-to-day -day lives of people who are most affected uh, by climate change. It tends to operate at a high level, you know, CO2, tons of CO2 uh, emitted or avoided. Um, and I think what President like Biden and Vice President like Harris are saying is that there are people uh, behind uh, these uh, these trends and these and these uh, dynamics uh, with climate, whose interests need to be specifically addressed and discussed. It kind of gets back to the just transition conversation. Climate change is affecting people's lives today. Uh, uh, air pollution is affecting people's lives today. It affects their neighborhoods. It affects their their, their children's health. Um, and I think the appointment of a, a couple of key people that we've seen recently, um, uh, specifically at EPA and at Interior signifies that Biden is taking this commitment to, uh, to, to, to um, climate justice and, and, and racial equity seriously and seeing it as an integrated part of his- uh, okay, let, me, let, me give you, let me give you two examples of uh, where this might play and ask you how you think that actually would play out in administration with leadership like this. When we talk about plastic pollution, a lot of people will think about plastic flowing down rivers and waterways and in the ocean. Other people will think about where the refinery is located and the communities of color disproportionately that are affected by the pollution and the air and the toxins that are associated with that. Um, one of the things we're doing uh, in association with the Global Futures Lab and public broadcasting is we have a series now called Planet Forward. It's on peril and promise, you can see it. And we're going to be um, featuring and profiling a man by the name of Henry Redcloud next month. Henry Red Cloud is, uh, started Lakota Solar. He lives on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and he's working with tribes across America to bring renewable energy to people who disproportionately don't even have, don't have electricity, but they don't have running water in many cases. How does this administration focused on climate justice address issues like that? Is it investing? Is it shutting plants down? What actually happens? Um, so I guess the 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 uh, the, the glib answer is um, we're we're going to see we're going to see how they how they how they address that issue. I mean, he's put together you know the the, the president like has put together a, uh, a a kind of high level plan for what uh, addressing environmental justice looks like um, that you know is on 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 his on his website. Uh, but I think this will be this will be Frank a a um, this will be for example one of the benefits of the new structure that they're putting in place and having Gina McCarthy and Ali Zaidi kind of helping coordinate across agencies on these issues and specifically keeping that issue of racial equity uh, and, and climate justice at, as a top priority will be one of their top priorities. And it hasn't, to your point, it hasn't been done before, right? It, it, it hasn't been done. What I imagine it will look like is that it, I imagine it will look like um, uh, hearing from the voices of affected communities on a much more regular uh, basis and building into policy decisions and regulatory decisions 
um, uh, considerations for how uh, 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 neighborhoods, communities, and, 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 and workers are affected. Again, this has not necessarily been something that the climate policy has focused on within the White House, uh, you know, even under the latter years of the, of the Obama administration. So I guess, that, I guess the unsatisfactory answer is, I don't exactly know what it will look like, uh, but the fact is that they're putting the right people together and with the right uh, intentions. And I think that's gonna you know, bear, bear quick fruit. Um, what about politics here? Just for a moment, I know your favorite subject, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, a national survey by Pew a couple of months ago, it was back in April, I think, found that 65% of the respondents to this particular poll, presuming we can still believe in polls, by the way, uh, said that the federal government was doing too little to reduce the effects of climate change. And yet many in the land, governors, state legislatures, certainly in, in, in Washington, Republicans and others, um, are gonna resist this. So what do you look for here and how does that equation get changed or does it? I, I think that what we're going to see uh, and what we have seen is a quiet uh, but, but, um, but seismic shift um, with respect to how the economy is moving and how it's even currently structured, that is changing how people think, not necessarily about climate change, but about the um, but about uh, industrial decision decisions of, uh, of corporations and industries as they as they uh, are are uh, related to climate change. What do I mean by that? Um, I, I give a series of talks uh, in in, um, in in kind of. Uh, rural and, and, and uh, rural parts and, and of, of the middle of the country um, as part of outreach that I do um, through the Atlantic Council. And, you know, I was in both Kansas and uh, Iowa just prior to COVID uh, coming online. Uh, those two states have seen the penetration of wind power in their, in their states go from about 5% to close to 40% over the last eight years. Um, so that, that's a that's a dramatic shift, uh, which occurred in a relatively short period of time, um, not because the residents of either of those two states woke up one morning and said we are now you know tree hugging uh, climate believers, but because they realized that that uh, renewable energy was the cheaper uh, right. uh, uh, alternative. We're seeing the same thing in sector after sector as lower carbon um, uh, alternatives um, uh, are the job creation vehicle for communities. And so I think that is the that will be the thing that pushes the politics more than more than anything else. Um, the science has been compelling for at least a decade, and it and it doesn't seem to necessarily be moving the needle significantly in terms of political action, at least in Washington. I think it's going to be the economics that moves it, um, and that's you know that's that's an, on one way a disappointing uh, you know outcome. On the other hand, I'll take it. Uh, and, and completely inevitable and, and explicable. Sure. Um, okay, we have lots of questions. I'm going to get to those in just a minute. One last one for you quickly before we do that. You were, you were at the National Security Council. You were at OPEC. Your focus was, you know, climate change around the world. How quickly will the United States, will Biden take the United States back into the Paris Climate Accord? And what impact will that have internationally? Um, it's a great question. So, I mean, the answer is he'll 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 state his intention to re-enter the Paris Accord. I think on day one, and uh, it's a 30-day process to re-enter. So, you know, uh, will you know the U.S. will be back in, um, you know, by the end of by the end of February. The question is, what does that mean? What what it you know what is that? What are the implications of that? The immediate implication of that is that the U.S. will be on the on the hook for developing what's called a nationally determined contribution, which is the um, our uh, submission to the international community for how quickly and in what order, Frank, to your earlier question, we are going to uh, uh, increase our emissions reductions. So that process, the creation of that NDC is, is going to be a top priority between the agencies. It's going to be a question of moving dials. Uh, and that's something that we will present, the U US will present, John Kerry will likely present it in Glasgow uh, uh, in November of, 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 20, uh, of 2021. Uh, to the international climate uh, talks. I think the bigger implication of rejoining Paris is that it's a signal that the US is recommitting itself to prioritizing climate change. Um, and it sends a very strong signal, I think, to international partners that climate change is going to be you know, a top issue 
in every conversation that the president has with counterparts. Let me just talk about what, what the power of that is. During the final two years of the Obama administration, climate change was issue number one or two on every single bilateral uh, meeting that the president had with foreign leaders. Every, really? Every one of them? Every one of them. I mean, literally every one. Small island developing states care about it for one reason. India has a very different, you know, the, the conversation may have been slightly different with different nuances, but climate change and the fact that the U.S. was focused on it and the fact that the U.S. wanted other countries to increase their ambition was a top priority in every bilateral agreement. The preparation for a head of state bilateral meeting, you know, it takes months. The entire bureaucracy is mobilized. It has a real impact on other countries when the U.S. is pushing the issue. And I think that will be an important uh, uh, and unseen side effect of rejoining Paris and committing ourselves. I, I, would, I, I just want to echo that, you know, having, <laughs> having been a reporter, having been a journalist at the White House for a long time, when a head of state, when the president of the United States goes to a meeting, the Sherpas and all the prep and all the bureaucracy gears up and there are questions that get asked and answered and there are deadlines and deliverables and it's a big deal. It's not just the president going to a meeting. So, you know, that is going to be a fascinating thing to, to, to watch, especially given the, the events of the past several years with extreme weather and sea level rise and all the rest uh, and, and that we've been seeing. Okay. Lots of questions here, so let's see if we can get to as many as possible. Let's, and I'm just going to, you know, start. Uh, how will the Biden administration? This is questions from from our from our, our our wonderful audience. How will the Biden administration, do you think, work with universities and NGOs to rebuild the infrastructure for scientific input into climate policy? What are the opportunities and challenges there? It's actually a great. Uh, it's a great question. Um, the, you know, the, the damage that has been done uh, over the last several years to kind of fact-based, you know, uh, research uh, and, and, um, and its conduit into the policy and decision-making process, I think has been significant. It was actually a topic of a conversation I was having yesterday with, uh, with, with, with John Podesta. Um, it, it, there, is a, there is a need uh, for the federal government to both support uh, and then make use of uh, uh, the, the the data, the science uh, that, are, that are coming out of institutions like like uh, ASU, and I guess I would just say that you know having, for example, um, the, the per, a person like a John Holdren, uh, who was the head of the uh, OSTP office, you know, in 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 within the White House. Having Office some science technology policy yeah. policy exactly having someone at that uh, at that level who has connections to academia uh, and the science community I think will be important as part of that process that that person has not yet been named so. would you bet on more research funding available I, I I would I mean we're dealing now with a pretty constrained fiscal environment in some ways <laughs> um, in some ways it's quite open but in other ways there's going to be a lot of competing pressures for it so um, but absolutely I, I would imagine this will be a top priority. Okay. Here's another question from uh, the audience. Energy, many energy folks uh, consider nuclear a renewable source, disregarding the question of rights, problems of waste, disposal, and theft for weapons de uh, development. Do you think nuclear is renewable? Um, I think nuclear is renewable. Um, I think, I, I, and, and, uh, but I, I, and, but I think that its role in the 2050 scenario and, and the kind of future energy mix, not just for the US, but the, but the world is one of those pretty significant dials that uh, needs to be carefully considered. I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not leaning against nuclear. I'm merely suggesting that if there are ways of us achieving net zero that do not involve nuclear, I think they are preferred. Uh, and uh, uh, for a number of reasons uh, that we probably don't have time to go into. Okay, um, well, we'll come back. We can do another one. With, we'll do another nuclear conversation another time if you'd like. Um, here's another one though. I, I do want to keep going because there's so many really excellent questions. Uh, this, is, this is interesting. The IPCC said in, a, in 2018 that we need to cut emissions in half by 2030 and down to net zero by 2050. We talked about Biden's net zero, or, you know, carbon neutral thing. I, uh, the, the writer continues, I can't fathom how we can get there with fossil fuel companies existing as they do now. What needs to happen to the fossil fuel industry in your view to meet these IPCC targets is public ownership and winding down an answer. 
Yeah. So look, this is the great question that, and it gets back to that question kind of gets back to the question of how do you, how do you phase out coal more quickly? And uh, you know, is, is there, are there, are there kind of essentially buyouts that need to occur? Um, and, you know, Germany, for example, just, just, just led a, uh, a reverse auction to take out 4.7 gigawatts of coal capacity um, uh, you know, from its grid. Poland's considering the same, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, metric or the same uh, process. Um, I, I think that, you know, and Biden has said by, by 2035, the U.S. electricity sector should be 100% clean and, and renewable. So this is not a, this is not a, um, a, a you know, a, a, a conceptual question. This is one that, again, the team will be working extremely hard on as part of the, these, these, N, these NDCs, nationally determined contributions. I think that if I were an oil and, and gas executive or a heavy investor in oil and gas stocks and companies right now, I would be taking a very hard look at my business model in the first case and my holdings in the second case. One thing we haven't talked about here, um, uh, Frank, is the financial markets and how they are evolving and, and beginning to kind of really- well, think, think of that for just a second because you yeah. are deep into that and that is hugely important. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the financial markets, when they tip, right, mar as we've seen in history, financial markets tend to, to, to tend to be a bit lemming like and they move they move they move quickly and, 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 and with a herd mentality. And I think we're nearing a tipping point uh, with respect to how financial institutions treat uh, climate risk and climate exposure. Some of that has been much of that has been at the at the urging uh, of activist groups and NGOs over the last 10 years. Uh, but what we're beginning to see now is even the, uh, the regulators uh, uh, and the big money managers are saying climate change is a risk that needs to be factored into our asset allocation decisions. I mean, Larry Fink at BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager said in January that climate change poses a systemic risk to the global economy and that they need to begin factoring climate change more carefully into how they allocate their capital. Um, Tr Trump's own CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading uh, uh, Commission uh, said, said, said the same thing recently. And then the Fed, Two days ago, uh, just joined an international network for you know for greening the financial institutions. Um, all of these big regulators are now seeing climate as a risk which needs to be priced uh, into our financial system. Uh, this is a very thoughtful question. California is considered best in class with respect to renewable power slash energy, yet experiences rolling blackouts each summer in the peak of high temperatures. How do we have power that works consistently uh, in this uh, in this situation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I'm, I, uh, I mean, you need, you need um, one of the words we haven't talked about yet here is resilience. Um, and and re what does resilience mean? It means that you, you have infrastructure that is resilient to the effects of climate change. And so one of the things that we need to do as we build back better uh, in, this, in this next uh, set of uh, federal, federal spending um, is we need to ensure that we're building infrastructure which is resilient to the very change and the very climate change that is uh, that that is forcing these investments in the in the first place. Um, that means hardening. The, the word is often used: hardening of grids of national infrastructure, ensuring that our, um, our 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 infrastructure can withstand increasing climate variability, temperature variability, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, strong uh, natural, uh, you know, disaster events, floods, et cetera. There is a way of doing that and building back that is much more resilient than our current infrastructure is. Uh, and again, that's, that'll be part of how the U.S. needs to think about not just meeting its climate commitments, but meeting its infrastructure uh, uh, you know, needs over the next 20 years. John, just a couple minutes left, but, but here's an, another one from, from the audience, which I, I think is very important. Yesterday was a historical transition for federally uh, recognized tribal nations with Deb Holland's um, nomination to be interior secretary. What the question is, what are some potential spaces slash collaborations to address the energy uh, transition and justice for tribes? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the obvious, the obvious answer to that, and maybe it's too obvious is that, you know, tr uh, uh, Native American uh, peoples, you know, occupy large, uh, tracts of land in this country, which have historically, getting back to the environmental justice uh, 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 point, Frank, from earlier, um, you know, happened to house lots of dirty, you know, dirty energy uh, throughout the country. Um, it, wouldn't it be, uh, wouldn't it be um, a nice change if, in fact, we were um, supporting investment 
uh, into clean energy, you know, on tribal lands with, you know, as part of a, as part of a, uh, uh, you know, an agreed upon uh, a plan of deployment with, with, with tribal nations. Um, and I think that is something that has been discussed in, uh, well, I know that something has been discussed, uh, but I think could be a part of what, of where we, where we go next with, uh, with Deb Holland at, uh, at Interior. So that, I think that is the, that's probably the easiest answer. Uh, to, to, to what that might look like. Uh, you know, I, I said that was going to be the last question from the audience, and I was going to ask one more, and then we'll wrap. But I, I lied because there's a great one here from the audience that I that I that I have to ask. You know, here you are. You've worked at the National Security Council. You've worked in the White House. You've worked at OPEC. You've gone all over the world. You look at this thing from such a gigantic, you know, with such a wonderful gigantic lens. But this question from from one of our participants, as an average citizen. What can I do to help climate change other than the well-known things I already do? What do you tell people when they ask you that? Um, it's, I mean, look, this is the question that, first of all, keep asking yourself the question. I ask myself the question every day, am I doing, am I doing enough? Am I doing, you know, I, I, I challenge myself and frankly, my, my two children challenge me more and, and push us, you know, push us further and, you know, in the, in the right direction with respect to purchasing habits. And, you know, we, 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 we took our 401k and, uh, and, and took, you know, emptied it of all fossil fuel stocks last, uh, last, uh, last de December. By the way, that's not easy. That's not easy to do. Uh, think about your investment. And how's, it, and how's it doing since, by the way? Oh, fine. I mean, better. I mean, if you had if you had not had oil and gas stocks for the last ten years, you would have been doing much better, right? Than than uh, than if you if you had them. So, okay. so uh, average citizen. Yeah, average citizen. Four, one, okay. Average citizen is. I mean, first of all, it sounds it sounds you know corny, uh, but you you gotta you gotta vote. You gotta vote with uh, with with climate change as a as a key as a key uh, feature of what you're what you're doing. You have to try to affect change at your neighborhood level. Um, you know, get involved with get, get involved with community efforts to to uh, you know to 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 um, to, to improve uh, the sustainability of 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 your of your community. Um, all these things are connected. I think corporations are now taking their cue from consumers in a way that they weren't five or ten years ago with respect to um, you know to climate change. So. I mean, I could run through a list of things, you know, make sure the next car you buy is an EV. If you can put solar on your roof, you know, eat a little bit less meat. Um, you know, those are, those are things that we all ought to be doing anyway. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think the big thing is to make sure that this is a decision that you're, you're pushing through your, your, your voting uh, in your, and in your local community. Okay, I'm gonna end with this one uh, with you. As Peter Schlosser indicated at the beginning, um, of our conversation here, the role and the mission of, of the Global Futures Laboratory, and, and so many, right, is to confront major challenges. Confront major challenges with imagination, transdisciplinary thinking. I mean, that's what Global Futures Lab certainly tries to do. And if there's anything that calls for that approach, it's the challenge of climate change. Um, but that can't only come from government. It's not gonna just come from government, Biden administration notwithstanding. So how can places like the Global Futures Lab, universities, ordinary people, workplaces, uh, help drive this with a national government that's actually engaged in it? It's a great way to end. And let me just say, I, I think the answer is relatively simple. You can inspire the current and importantly, the next generation of young people to understand that the climate challenge, while daunting and existential, also provides a tremendous springboard and opportunity for their careers, for your careers, for the careers of young people entering the market today. And if young people entering the workforce today make decisions about where they work uh, based upon a set of considerations around sustainability and climate change, that has a seismic and very quick impact on the direction of how corporations work. Um, for too long, I think we uh, have, have, you know, uh, have not factored climate change into how we, um, what types of careers we pursue. And, and, and the status quo is simply not a, an option anymore from a, from a climate perspective. So I think uh, you know, ASU, the Global Futures Lab can inspire young people to commit to following career paths that place a high priority on climate action 
and on designing a more sustainable and durable and clean future for the uh, for the globe. And uh, I hope that that's uh, I hope that that's something that the Global Futures Lab does. And it sounds like it's uh, it's 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 very much committed to that. To that, to impact driven research, and to capturing it and telling the stories around it that can be inspiring both to the experts and to to to, to young folks. Well. Um, I'm going to let you leave us with uh, sort of a one-liner. Uh, if you're looking to see whether the administration is successful with all these promises, what's the first and most important thing you're looking for? Frank, that's a very hard way to way to end. I'm um, <laughs> a one-liner. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, I think I'm going to I'm going to punt on the question and just say what he has done already in terms of the nominations. Take a look if you haven't yet. Take a look on at the team that he's put together. Just look at the faces, look at the backgrounds, look at the biographies and look at how each one of those people coming into or nominated for top positions, cabinet level positions across various agencies, agriculture, transportation, treasury, interior, EPA have all talked about climate change in their acceptance in their in their thanks for the nomination speech this is not a side issue it's front and center this has never happened before that's an exciting moment john morton thank you so much for your time today and for your insight and for all you do and good luck with what you're doing because it matters on many many levels thank you very much frank it's a pleasure let me hand it back over to jason friends now he's going to tell you um how you can access this conversation share it uh jason over to you All right, Frank Sesno and John Morton, thank you so very much for this wonderful conversation. We will be having this conversation posted on our social media channels through Facebook, Twitter, and across other uh, platforms, along with our partners over at Planet Forward and across multiple ASU programs in the next day or so. So please look for that. And I encourage you to share it with as many people as possible so that they can learn more about what this next uh, four years may bring in terms of climate action, as well as what you can individually do per this uh, insight that we've received from Mr. Morton. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you very much to our audience and for all the great questions. And we hope you have a great weekend and good holiday season. Thank you. <laughs>